I want to start today kind of where, to some extent, where we left off yesterday in terms of, um, in, in this negative, in, in terms of the cultural suffocation that I think we, to some extent, all live in. And, uh, but I want to emphasize a different aspect of this uh, this morning. And that is the altruism that dominates our culture and the altruism that all of us to some extent or another, grew up with. The fact that we grew up being taught that what we should focus on in terms of what is important is what is good for other people. The focus on sacrifice, the focus on the other. And the flip side of that, what we weren't taught growing up, and how to focus on our own values, how to identify our own values. Indeed, that was often suppressed in the name of altruism. So many of us, I think, don't know how to be, particularly when we're young, we're starting out, how to be selfish. Selfishness is an achievement. It requires effort. It requires focus. It requires really thinking about what is really good for me and how to attain that. But that is always, throughout our lives, we've been told, don't do that. That's not good. That is the opposite of morality. And even if consciously we're aware that that is wrong, it takes a lot to integrate that conscious knowledge into your subconscious and to start focusing on what is really good for me. What are my values? How do I pursue my values? And I think that explains why for many objectives, particularly when, when we're young, art is so difficult, because art is that that is most personal. It is most about my values, my happiness, my response, my emotions, me. Art is selfish. And it's hard to be selfish given how we were raised, given the context, the, 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 the cultural context, the social context in which we live. And it requires effort to engage in being selfish. Um, it, it's, it's somewhat easier, I guess, to do it in the conceptual realm. I think it's actually harder to, mm -hmm. to, to do it in, in that realm that is more subconscious, that realm that is more emotional. It takes time for the emotions to catch up with the ideas. Uh, and, it's, and it's less in our control, or we feel like it's less in our control. So it's something that needs to be activated consciously. We need to work at getting to the point where the integration is, is there. We need to pursue our values, really make the effort to discover our values, pursue them, and engage with them. It doesn't happen. It's not just going to happen automatically. Um, yeah, I wanted to, uh, this is really emphasized at the start of the Romantic Manifesto in the psychoepistemology of art. And I mean, I think most people in this room know that Ayn Rand is an opponent of altruism, to put it mildly. And this is how she characterizes th this aspect of what altruism does to a person and to a culture. One of the grimmest monuments to altruism is man's culturally induced selflessness, his willingness to live with himself as with the unknown, to ignore, evade, repress the personal, the non-social needs of his soul, to know least about the things that matter most, and, then, and thus to consign his deepest values to the impotent underground of subjectivity and his life to the dreary wasteland of chronic guilt. The cognitive neglect of art has persisted precisely because the function of art is non-social. Art belongs to a non-socializable aspect of reality, which is universal, i.e. applicable to all men, but non-collective to the nature of man's consciousness. And the, this emphasis that it's non-social, I think is really important, because um, you can and we might talk a little bit later about this. You can read the Romantic Manifesto. I think it's a misinterpretation, but I can see where the misinterpretation comes from, that art is about you being on trial. 
It's like, what is it going to expose about me to other people? Um, and how are they going to judge me given that I like this work of art or don't like that? And you have to take really seriously the opening of the Romantic Manifesto, that that's not the perspective at all, and that it's non-social. It's about you and your relationship to reality, and who cares what other people think about that? Um, I mean, one of the ways, one of the titles that I was going to put sort of as a subhead here, art, and part of the value of art is to know thyself. If you take that sort of maxim from Delphi in, in ancient Greece, it's, and it's, you should be intensely interested in knowing what you are, what you actually be, believe, your deepest convictions. You can't change, you can't engage in self-development and self-improvement if you don't know where you are. And art is a powerful, powerful lens into that aspect of yourself. So it's, it, I really think of it as radically non-social. Yeah, and in that sense, radically selfish. Right? Yeah. So, because it, it's about you, it's about your values, and it's about your self-improvement, and it's about you seeing your values in concrete form out there, identifying what you really value, what your sense of life is, and that, we'll talk about that in a little while, and using that as a tool, both as a, in fuel to fuel yourself, but also as a tool to improve yourself, also as a tool to, to, to find the things where you need work. Uh, so it's, it's incredibly valuable. So one of the goals this morning, one of my goals this morning, our goals this morning, is to encourage you to engage with art, to encourage you to, to, to really go out there and explore and find your values and find what you love. And I'm gonna, I've made this statement uh, on my podcast many times, but uh, I, I think it's worth repeating. The things that are not in your control, as much as we'd like them to be in our control, they're not in your control. One of those things is a thing that I focus on a lot because it's what I do, politics. Politics on Facebook. <laughs> Stop it. It's not that important. You're not going to change anybody's mind, or you're going to change at the margin a few people's minds, but it's not going to change the world. And it's not going to make you happier. It's not going to contribute to your happiness unless this is what you do. Now, I, for me, this is what I do, right? So it is my career. So for me, it's, it's, it's what does make me happy. But for most of us, it doesn't. I can see you being miserable on Facebook. <laughs> focus most of your effort. I'm not saying don't do it at all, but focus most of your effort on things that are in your control, things that can actually contribute to your life, things that will actually make you happy. You know, last year I gave a talk about rational optimism. And part of that is there are so many things in the world out there that you have control over, that you have access to, particularly in the world we live in today, better than at any period in all of human history. You have the ability to create your life, your environment in which you live on a day-to-day -day basis. Make it beautiful. Make it something you enjoy. Make it something when you walk into your house, you smile. Put art on the wall, engage with art, because it's in your control. It's something, it doesn't matter what Trump does or what Hillary does, you can buy your art. Or you can buy reproductions. One of the things, you know, I think that's important is you don't have to buy originals. It's, it's not the fact that it's an original that gives the art the value. It's what the artist is projecting. Now, there's an added value being original, partially because the originals are better than yeah. the reproductions. But Often, you can get so much out of the reproduction, you don't have to wait to be a millionaire to buy art. You can buy posters for $10, $15, and, and put them on your walls and enjoy them. So make your life, those parts of your life that you can control, make them beautiful. Yeah, you go outside and you see this crap that is called corporate whatever art. But so what? So at least your environment, where you have control, make it, make it, as beautiful and as meaningful to you as possible. And again, it's for you, it's not for your visitors, it's not for other people, it's for you, so what do you love? On, put it on display. Um, it's, you're bringing up beauty, I think that's an interesting issue in regard to art and about 
its sort of place in the Romantic Manifesto? Because I think of it much more, but I think we're probably a bit different in this regard. It's to fill my life with meaning, um, and an aspect of that is beauty, but beauty has, it has a real place for me in art, but not, it's not the highest place for me. I mean, it's part of why I like Shakespeare. I would, I mean, the <laughs> language is beautiful, I mean, unbelievably beautiful, but I don't think of the plays as beautiful, but I find them meaningful, and that's part of the, the I think part of what, at least art for me gives, is a heightened sense of reality, and that that's really important to me, to see reality in sort of high relief, that things stand out and the unimportant fades away. Um, and to, to that as a regular experience, it's part of what you brought up yesterday about it, it has, it's a training of your own consciousness of how to look at reality. And for me, that is a major, major value of art, that it stylizes my view of the world and my, the, my way of looking at the world. And for me, that's highly important and highly meaningful. And beauty has, it's not, I'm not anti-beauty, but it's, it is a secondary, but very important value for me. Yeah, and this is personal, right? For me, it's, it's much more important. Yeah. So I want to live in a house that's beautiful, with a view that's beautiful, with furniture that's beautiful, with things on the wall that is beautiful. And maybe that's why I respond to visual art more than you respond yeah. to visual art in that sense. So again, this is personal. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be different uh, 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 between us. So I, I, the point I want to make, I'll just repeat it, is focus most of your effort on the things that are in your control. And don't obsess about things that are out of your control. I mean, yes, get angry when you need to get angry, but then put it aside. You only live once. Again, your anger is not going to change politics, so what's going on in the world and other places, focus on what you can do to make your life the best life that you can have. So I, I, I want to I shift a little bit and, and just uh, talk, about, talk about the difference between what you like, what you love, and what is great art. Because I think there's a lot of confusion here. And, and I know different people respond differently to me, but when somebody comes and tells me, that's a great movie, I go, really? <laughs> How do you know that? By what criteria are you measuring great? I'm fine with people telling me I loved that movie. Then I understand it. You responded to it. But what are the aesthetic standards for measuring a great movie? And do you, do I, know those aesthetic standards? And you have to be an expert to evaluate greatness. Not to evaluate like, I can't tell you what you like, but to evaluate greatness, you have to be an expert. Ayn Rand's an expert in literature. She's an expert in most of the arts in some extent, but certainly in literature. Mm -hmm. And she identifies greatness in literature, and she can tell you exactly why every play or, 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 or novel that she identifies as great, why it's great, and she has aesthetic criteria for what makes it great. And by the way, the philosophical message is not in that list, right? It's whether the, every other aspect integrates into whatever that philosophical message is, or what, what the theme is. Everything integrates into that, and everything's integrated in. But in every art form, whether it's literature, painting, sculpture, and of course music, have different aesthetic criteria. And Ayn Rand talks about that. Painting is about color and about reflecting a theme through the use of color. That's very different than what literature is about. Painting doesn't have a plot. Painting really doesn't have characterization. It has an element of that when there's a human being there, but it's not fully characterization. Every one of these art forms is different and requires real expertise, aesthetic expertise to be able to evaluate what is great and what is not. And I always am hesitant to say something is great. I sometimes say it and, and, and have to think to myself, I shouldn't have done that because it's so easy to say when you love something, oh, that was great. But it was great for me. In that sense, it's great. But is it great art? Is it a great movie? So let's take movies just for a minute, right? Movies are the most complex form of art that exists because it is an integration of many art forms. It, movies have a plot, they have characterizations, they have elements of literature. Mm -hmm. But Ayn Rand talks about movies as primarily visual, as the main 
way in which the theme is conveyed is visually, not through the dialogue. So how do we evaluate the visual aspects of a movie? Is the cinematography good? Is the cinematography adding up to the theme of the actual movie? Of course, movies also have actors. So there's a whole element of acting, which is an aesthetic element. Are the actors good? What is good acting? What is bad acting? What's mediocre acting? Sometimes you can feel it, but can you actually articulate what it means? That's what an expert would be able to do. There's music in movies. Is the music supporting the theme or isn't it supporting the theme? Is it going against it? Is it fully integrated? Those are all hard things to figure out. And it's, it's, it requires, and I'm not saying you can't do it, I'm just saying it requires real focus, it requires study, it requires knowledge that I think very few people have in, let's say, movies. Right? Um, if you listen to Leonard Peikoff's, and I highly, highly recommend you do, uh, Eight Great Plays, I think it was mentioned last night, Eight Great Plays um, is one of my favorite Leonard Peikoff courses of all. You can see the level of expertise that Leonard has had to gain. How much he's read, how much he's studied, how much he's thought about, how many plays he saw, how many plays he read in order to, to, to do the analysis that he does. And the analysis is brilliant. It's, it's, it's amazing and it's fun. And it really gives you a sense of what goes into a play and into understanding a play and viewing a play. And, and, but all the different elements. And that analysis isn't even what happens on stage. That's just reading the play. There's a whole other dimension once it's staged that he doesn't even cover because he, he, he's not analyzing the actual stage performances. So I just, I just want to say, you know, we'll talk about what you, what you love and you like, but pay attention to these different forms of evaluation. Right? There's an aesthetic evaluation, and then there's a personal evaluation. And those two are not the same thing. And I mean, this connects to a point that we were talking about last time about, I mean, two points. One about Ayn Rand, that she's a great artist, and that's really relevant for reading and getting what's in the Romantic Manifesto. And the wider point about aesthetics as a branch of philosophy, the way I think about it is there's a, as, there's a direct parallel between politics as a branch of philosophy and then there's derivative areas of study under that, like political science and philosophy of law, that a philosopher doesn't, just by virtue of being a philosopher, does not have expertise, political science, about the full design of a political system that is functional in terms of checks and balances, the divisions of power between the branches of government. So that's part of what philosophers, uh, political science and philosophy of law study. And I think there's a parallel in regard to aesthetics, that there's, there's basic things that you, a philosopher says about art, and one of the basic things is about the need that art provides. But then to go into all the aesthetic criteria for judging works of art, and then as you're saying, in the different fields and the way those principles and the standards of judgment vary across the fields, that's a specialized study for which you need a lot of knowledge, just as in political science, you need a lot of knowledge about the actual construction of different forms of government to see what, which ones endured for a long time, which one collapsed easily, and so what did the different when it, powers were divided in different ways and they had different checks and balances, how did this play out and so on, to try to devise, which is what the founding fathers did, a system that can endure over time um, and preserve rights and liberty. That's a complex endeavor of creation. And it's relevant when they're thinking about it that they're also involved in the creation of a political system. And the same in regard to aesthetics. I think there's very few people that I find interesting in aesthetics in reading, when you're reading about detailed art and analysis that are not also creators in it, because it gives you a perspective that is, I think, very hard to gain if you don't have that experience. So here's an example from Ayn Rand. Now, we know Ayn Rand considers Hugo, Dostoevsky, Tolstoy great artists. Mickey Spillane, eh, you know, okay artist, mediocre artist, right, as an artist. But this is what she writes. She says, I love the work of Victor Hugo. I like Dostoevsky. I like the early novels of Mickey Spillane. 
I cannot stand Tolstoy. Right? So these are her personal evaluations as to what she likes. Even though she recognizes Tolstoy is a great artist, she can't stand him. Even though she recognizes Mika Spillane is just okay qua artist, she likes him. And she uses the same work like to Dostoevsky, who's a great artist, right? So you've got to make that separation. She says, it's not contradictory to say this is great work of art, but I don't like it. And in spite of that, <laughs> I encourage you to engage in great art. Uh, and, and again, I would even the ones you don't like. Uh, and, and I refer you again to Leonard Peikoff's course, uh, lecture, and it, people ask me where can they find it. You can find it on the East Store. It's not yet on, uh, on some of our other platforms, but it's in the East Store. I assume at some point it'll be uh, on campus and, uh, and uh, maybe on YouTube, but it's uh, on the East Store. Uh, it's uh, the survival value of great but philosophically false art. And, uh, it, it, you know, it's, it's why you should read Tolstoy. Why you should read Dostoevsky in spite of the, 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 the negativity and the, the horrible sense of life. Or at least try to, right? At least make an effort to because there's great value to be attained in it. All right, so I want to I move over to, um, to are we going to talk about sense of life now? Yeah, we can. Okay, thank you. Um, and so I think sense of life is a complex topic. The first thing, I think, when you encounter the Romantic Manifesto and you read about this idea of sense of life, and she, she, well, part of what she's arguing in the Romantic Manifesto is that one's response to art is a product of one's sense of life, and the creation of art is a product of sense of life. But the first thing one should ask about when you encounter this idea is, do I think there's such a phenomenon as sense of life, and in particular, do I think that I have a sense of life? Um, not to go around, okay, Ayn Rand said there's a sense of life, now let me start analyzing everything in terms of sense of life. You have no handle on the idea or the concept, and all you can do is apply it very rationalistically. Um, and again, going to the issue of art as non-social and that it's about yourself, the primary thing one should be interested in is, do I think I have a sense of life. Um, and you get in the, in the Romantic Manifesto, and particularly the, obviously the two articles, philosophy and sense of light, and art and sense of life, her description of the process through which a sense of life is formed. Um, and I, I've written a little bit on this in the companion to Ayn Rand, um, my article on a being of self-made soul, because I think it's it's a significant element of understanding what she means by an individual as a self-made soul. So for some elaboration, um, you can look at that. But what I want to emphasize one point that's, I think, particularly relevant to the kind of the theme today, which is how individual a sense of life is and how individualized it is. And part of the reason for why it's so individual or individualized, because the way that she says the primary process through which a sense of life is formed is a process of emotional abstraction or emotional generalization. It's classifying things in reality, and, and mostly this is a sort of subconscious classification, of classifying things in reality by the common emotion they invoke in you and the in you is important, not the kind of emotion they invoke in everybody. It's the emotion they invoke in you and grouping things together under the same emotion. And I give in the companion, I'm gonna quote this because I think it's, 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 a, I mean, it's, very, it's a very good illustration of what she, I think the process that she means, it's a description of Kira and we the living. And it's, it's, it's capturing some of her emotions, but particularly this perspective of an emotional generalization or an emotional abstraction. Um, so that, I'm not going to read the full pattern. There's more in it than this, but let, some highlights. And th th so let me start from quoting We Living. Kira had the same feeling, and let me just pause and underline, the same feeling for eating soup without salt and for discovering a snail slithering up her bare leg and for young men who pleaded, broken-hearted, 
their eyes humid, their lips soft. She had the same feeling, and again, same feeling, for white statues of ancient gods against black velvet in museums, and for steel shavings and rusty dust and hissing torches and muscles tense as electric wires in the roar of a building under construction. She seldom visited museums, but, they went, what, sorry, but when they went out with Kira, her family avoided passing by any construction works, houses, and particular ro particularly roads, and most particularly bridges. But she could never be made to enter a public park on Sunday, and she stuck her fingers in her ears when she heard a chorus singing folk song. Close quote. And that, if you, that's part of uh, what I think it looks like to have emotional generalizations. And notice how highly individual that is. And you're not going to find that in another person. And, it's, and this is just one example of a process that she thinks goes on regularly, that you classify things, and particularly you do this early on, um, before you're fully conceptual, you can't articulate it. It's part of why it's an emotional generalization, not a conceptual generalization. But you're putting things, and it, they have obviously, and this is tremendous value significance to you. And it's part of what then starts to form what you regard as important in life, and what you regard as unimportant in life. But it's so highly individual that you're not going, I mean, this is part of why she links it to the issue of romance. You're not going to find someone who has the exact sense of life as you. And part of when then she talks about the response to art, it's not necessarily that it's everything in the work of art is your sense of life or vice versa, but you can have a real affinity that it's, th there's a real element of my sense of life that is captured in a work of art and that I'm responding to. Yeah, and in, in discovering your own sense of life, because this, this happens automatic and because a lot of it happens when yeah. you're very young, when you're not conscious of what, what is going on, what odd does for you as an adult is it allows you to expose that in yourself. But you have to make an effort to do that. You have to, you have to go out and experience the odd, and you have to think about it. Yeah. You have to introspect about it. Why do I like it? Why does it make me feel what I feel? What is it about the work of art that does that? And it's, that's not easy. <laughs> it's not easy. It, it needs, you need to train yourself to actually do that, to actually engage in that. But the reward is self-knowledge. The reward is the identification of your sense of life and the stylizing of your consciousness, as we, we, we've talked about yesterday. And then the ability then to start, to some extent, impacting your sense of life, changing your sense of life. And that happens, that can happen. It takes, it takes work and it, it takes time. And the younger you are, the easier it is to do it. But it means thinking about your conscious values, finding art that you respond to that has those conscious values, understanding your existing sense of life and how it corresponds or doesn't correspond to your, concept, your, your conscious values and actually letting that integration happen. And again, part of letting that happen is the experience of art. It's the experience, experiencing it over and over again and you know, challenging yourself and going out and seeing more and different kinds of art and challenging yourself to introspect and identify what it is that that art does for you. And I think one of the important things to get about sense of life, we talked a little bit about this from other aspects yesterday, is, um, and this is stressed in the Romantic Manifesto, and she stresses it also when she gets Q&As about art and sense of life. You can't view it as everybody has a really formed sense of life that is consistent, so one formed. So she thinks there's such a thing as, this person has a vague, um, indeterminate sense of life. He has some elements, because it, it's, if you think of it as it's emotional generalization, it involves values. Not everybody has values that they're formed and then they're viewing the world through it and generalizing through it. There's some aspect of that, but you can have a vague, indeterminate sense of life. You certainly can have all kinds of clashing elements in it, and the artists can too. So the idea that an artwork always presents a consistent sense of life, that is a very rare thing, I think. 
And I think she thinks it's very rare. Even when you get to the level of great art, and she comments on that in the Romantic, matter of fact, both say, I mean, in painting, she comments about Dali having real conflicting elements in the sense of life that is projected in his paintings, and Vermeer, uh, who I think she obviously loves, that there's real conflicting elements in it. So you can't go into it. This, like, this is the rationalism about, okay, well, it's a great work of art, so it must have a consistent sense of life, so let me identify what that is. That's not how it works. And so part of the real value of art, it can help you form your sense of life that you, because you're seeing the world through a value perspective and you're getting, that's what it looks like to look at the world through a value perspective. And I could be more like that and I can develop my values and learn to express them. And that is in part the formation, not just the conscious identification of it, but the actual formation of a sense of life. And she, I think she thinks that's an L, real, I mean, it's part of why she thinks art in um, for the people developing, so for children, teenagers, is really important because it helps them not just identify their self of life, sense of life, but actually form it. Yep. <clears throat> so I, I want to <clears throat> move on to kind of uh, the the uh, uh, practical side in the sense of uh, giving you some advice on finding art you like and uh, uh, and and how to how to deal with that or, or, or how to expand your horizons and and they really two sections here I, I, I want to do. First, I want to I encourage you to find the art that you like. And second, I want to encourage you to expand your horizons and try things you might be a little bit uncomfortable in terms of trying or go outside of the art you know that you like so that you discover new things. So first, figure out what you like. Make a list. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, go around. Uh, think of all the movies you've seen that you like, the music that you like, the things that you like, and start introspecting about what you like about the things that you already like. Engage in that, embrace that. Y you know, uh, uh, immerse yourselves in the things that you already like. Uh, don't say, because, <laughs> because we've said here some of it might not be great art, oh, I need a, I, I, I don't want to like that anymore. Well, but you do like it. Acknowledge that you like it. Try to understand why you like it. So start with that. That has to be the beginning. What are your values? What, what, how are your values reflected in the art that you like right now? Don't shy away from that. Don't run away from that. That is the, that is the starting point of your journey with regard to aesthetics and with regard to art. Um, and the, the, the issue of art forms and understanding which art forms you l really respond to and which you don't, I think is important. So the, at, or at least the advice that I took from the Romantic Manifesto was not, okay, you have to enjoy every form of art equally, so spend one quarter of your time in music and one quarter of your time in painting, one quarter in sculpture. You have to get what you're really responding to. I have a real hierarchy of values in terms of forms of art, like music is way on the top, then it's sculpture, it used to be literature and painting, but way down. Painting is higher now. For, literature's bottom for me in those arts. And you can see that in Ayn Rand. Uh, one of the questions I like in the Q&A book is, I think it's in the Q&A book, um, that she's asked about the, that she must love architecture. It comes up. And her view is, yeah, no, a lot of people write to me, I must love architecture. I don't love architecture. I wrote The Fountainhead, and for the theme of The Fountainhead, it was logical to choose an architect as the center of it, because the elements of science and art coming together in, in, in this field. Um, and then she spent two, two years researching this, but she said, like, after The Fountainhead, architecture has no special meaning to me. I like painting and music, for instance, higher than architecture. And that, it's important in terms of being selfish, that, I mean, I know what the areas that I want, and so in terms of exploration and trying to find new values and so on, it's, I, I explore music and sculpture much more than the other arts. I still expose myself to the others, and I've developed a liking of painting that I didn't have before, but it, it is, I mean, you have so much time, you have to really go after what it is that you respond to and what you seem to really value. And you're going to get different things from different art forms. And again, we're yeah. going to be different in this sense. Uh, you know, again, in the Romantic Manifesto, it's clear Fine Rand literature is at the top, right? That's the most important. She is, she is a novelist, after all. And, and, and that's where she gets 
the most profound uh, 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 response, right, to, to, is the literature. Her most profound response is the literature. Uh, and she gets something different, I think, from music. And, you know, one example is, um, is a response. I mean, I'm bewildered somewhat by a response to Beethoven, right? She doesn't like Beethoven. And I understand why, because essential to Beethoven's metaphysical value judgment is the importance of the struggle. It's the importance of conflict. It's the importance of the, of the fight, right? Now, in, in some of his music ends with defeats, but not all of his music ends with defeat. And now Rand says, I, I don't want that in my music. I don't want the struggle in my music. But the struggle exists in the literature she loves, right? So in literature, she's willing to, ex to, willing to embrace the struggle, the battle of values, but not in music, because in music she's looking for something else. And I love the struggle in music. I love Beethoven. And it, you know, to me, that clash that, that is the clash of values, the, 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 the fight, the, the battle that is expressed in Beethoven's music, that energizes me. That, you know, that there's nothing that gets me going more than a Beethoven symphony uh, or, or a concerto before a debate. Right? Uh, <laughs> because he's reflecting exactly what I'm experiencing, and it, 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 it provides me with real energy. Um, and, and there's nothing quite more profound for me than, 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 uh, than listening to Beethoven. He's, he's really, at, you know, really high up on the top. So in different art forms, we might find different of our values, and that, again, that will vary across individuals. Right? I recognize the malevolence in many of Beethoven's, in much of Beethoven's music. And I can abstract that away and enjoy what I find important in Beethoven's music, right? The energy that it provides, the energy that it projects. Right? And, you know, some people ask me what the secret of the energy that I have on stage in other places. Maybe there it is. I mean, it is. It's, it's, it's an art that fuels me. And art is a huge part of my life, has been since I was 20 years old huge part of my life, and I don't think my life would be anywhere near what it is today without that. I'm married to an artist, and that's part of it. Right? Um, so I encourage you to, yeah, to go out, and, 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 but don't, yeah, don't do 25%, 25%, 25%. Uh, figure out what you love. Figure out what art form is most important to you, and how much, and what you get out of it. But don't do it passively. We, we, we tend to to, you know, it's too easy to enjoy the art we enjoy and just be passive about it. I think if you really want to get the full benefit of the aesthetic experience, you've got to figure out why you like it. You've got to start thinking about it. You've got to start evaluating and judging it, the art that's around you. And as you do that with the things you like, I think that'll open you up to liking more things. It'll open you up to broadening your horizons in terms of what I would call elevating your taste, right? Because it's easy for us to like stuff that's good. The, I'll use Mickey Spillane, although Mickey Spillane's really good, but you know, Mickey Spillane, we wanna elevate ourselves up so we can like Victor Hugo. It's really important that we do that in every one of these different art forms uh, and and, and it, that, that's going to take work. And the first step in the work is to figure out what you what you, why you like what you like and, and, and it, start evaluating it. All right, so the second point is uh, that I want to make is how to elevate, how to expand, how to, how to learn about art, more about art and about what is available to you and then figure out whether you like it or not. And, and here I would basically say, um, you know, study, study the Romantic Manifesto. Read it again. You read it before the conference, read it after the conference. You might get mm -hmm. a little bit more out of it or different, something different out of it given that we've talked about it so much and you're probably talking in the halls about it and about the art and you're seeing art, uh, you know, out, 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 outside it in the Coday Gallery and, and you're thinking about it. So now is a great time to reread it when it's part of your context, where you're really absorbed by it. I, I, you know, things I would recommend in terms of just, I, again, Leonard Peikoff's uh, works on art, both 
the, 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 the lecture I mentioned and the course, Eight Great Plays. I mean, it'll make you view movies differently, the Eight Great Plays. Even though it's a different art form, there's similarities enough between that it'll make you look at movies differently once you, once you uh, take the Eight Great Plays, um, Eight Great Plays course. Uh, you know, I would read the, the Q&A book, uh, Robert Mayhew's edited version of the Q&A book, the section on aesthetics. is fascinating just to see how Ayn Rand answers questions about art. It, it, there's some amazing content there. Uh, so find as much material as you can within the objectivist realm about it. But don't use it as a guide, okay, now I have to do these things. Use it to try to understand better what it is you're experiencing. And then I'd recommend, even if it's just a, a, a short book or, or a course or somewhere, you know, one of these uh, um, uh, online courses or something, just a basic art history course. Everything pre-20th century, forget about the 20th century, art history analysis of the 20th century is useless. It's, it's worse than useless, it's, it's evil, it's bad, right? But they're pretty good at pre-20th century. You know, they, they can identify what's good art and what's not and what's, what's, what's relevant and what's not in pre-20th century art and just get a, get a sense of, of, of what has happened and, and how it has evolved. You want to add, add anything? I want to say something about the contemplation, yep. but I don't know if that... Yeah, go for it. Um, so Iran's emphasizing sort of setting a sort of context for you in the actual viewing of art, but the actual experience of it, and as Ayn Rand says at the start of the Romantic Manifesto, it's not distinctive to her, art is for the sake of contemplation. That's part of why it's always thought as not having a function. That's not her view, because that contemplation is really, really important. But contemplation does not mean experiencing it for five seconds. It means taking the time to enter a world. Um, and you really have to, that is demanding on the part of the viewer. And this is a point that's emphasized in, the, in Atlas Shrugged with Richard Haley. And you have to live up to the artistic achievement, not expect he's gonna hand it to you in a way that I can just be half asleep and I should respond to this. So it takes energy, it's not, it's not a struggle or anything, but it takes real focus and it takes time. And there's, uh, Your Honor, we both mentioned the Q&A book because it, it's really, really helpful to have her Q&A gathered by theme in terms of aesthetics and art and various comments she's made and answers she's given. One question she's asked, is something like, why am I so tired when I go to museums? <laughs> <clears throat> and her answer is, you, you're switching universes too often. So it's not, well, they don't put carpet, it's marble floors and so on. <laughs> it's, you're switching universes too often. And that is, it's straining, and it's straining mentally to do that. Um, the, so the idea of going through a museum that it's a five hour sludge, I've gotta go see everything that I, I, it's in the guide, and, so, and I'll spend 15 seconds in front of each. And so, that is a completely selfless way of experiencing art. Um, and when, when she, like I, I would never had a duty premise in regard to art, so when I go to a museum and if someone tells me, well, did you see this highlight or that highlight? And I say, no, I went and I saw a few things and that's what I did. And I never like, oh my God, I didn't go to see. Um, now it's important, Ron's been emphasizing, you should go see great art, but it's not, you have to see in the Louvre every piece of great, you couldn't do it and it would be it, unbelievably exhausting. But what I do do now as a result of that Q&A is when I go to a museum, I try to consume, even if they're in different rooms and so on, the paintings or the sculpture of the same artist and only that's all I'm looking at and I try not to look at the other things as because I want to enter that person's world and that takes time and it takes effort on your part. I find some of the best museums or exhibits where it's the work of one artist like the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam is enormously powerful. Um, and I respond to it, I don't love Van Gogh, but there, I respond to it, and it's in part because you see his a real collection of works and you feel like you've entered, if you spend time and really contemplate, you feel like you've entered Van Gogh's world. And that is a, it, that's a unique experience, but it takes effort on your part. Um, again, not, it's not painful, but it is also, you, you, I mean, I often won't look at, a, uh, I'm too tired to look at a good movie. 
it's, it's, uh, it reminds me, the Van Gogh exhibit, it reminds me of, of, uh, of the Vermeer exhibit a few years ago in, the, in, in uh, it was in Washington, D.C., and it was the largest collection of Vermeers in one place ever. And I remember standing in the snow, it was freezing, um, at 4 a.m. to be able to get tickets and standing all that whole morning and uh, trying to keep warm with coffee in multiple layers. And I think it's the coldest I've ever been in my life. <laughs> and you haven't been to Canada. I haven't been to Canada <laughs> in the winter. I've been to Minnesota in February. But, but, um, oh <laughs> and, but once, you, once you go into that exhibit, and, you, and you know, we spent hours, we spent hours in there. Wow. I mean, it was just such a spiritual experience. It was such a fantastic uh, emotional experience. And again, even Vermeer is mixed, right? Because the themes of Vermeer, the, 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 the um, subjects are boring. They're very naturalistic. But you're entering the universe of his, of his uh, epistemology, in a sense, and the way he views the world. His style is so illuminated. It's so beautiful. It's so amazing. And it, it, it's, just, it's just quite an experience. So uh, there was another exhibit of Houdon's yeah. sculpture at the, at, the, uh, at the Getty Museum, yeah. I don't know, 10 years ago. And again, just sculpture after sculpture after sculpture of sheer genius. And, and uh, it, it was, again, powerful, powerful experiences. But here's some advice about going to a museum. I encourage you to go to museums. Uh, when you're traveling to a new city, go to the museum. We're in Cleveland. I haven't been to the museum yet. I'm going to try to get away this week at some point and go over there. Uh, my guess is it's, a, it's, it's got some good artwork. Why? Because uh, wealthy businessmen in, uh, in the 19th century, late 19th century, early 20th century, lived in Cleveland. Cleveland was an industrial center, part of the Industrial Revolution. They tended to collect art. They tended to collect good art from Europe and from the United States. Uh, and then they tended to, to, or their children tended to donate it to the local museum. So my guess is there's good 19th century art in, at the museum in Cleveland. Now, I hope it's not in the basement. Much of it is. I can guarantee that. I hope some of it's on display. Some of you might have been there already and can tell me. But, uh, but it's worth going. When you walk into a room in a museum in order to avoid some of this fatigue, scan it quickly. Notice something that attracts your eye and go to the thing that attracts your eye. Don't try to see everything. See the thing that first attracted you. Now, you might miss some, some amazing paintings there, but the first time you're at a museum, go just in every room to one or two paintings that strike you initially, and then stand there, contemplate it, feel, emote, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And then try to think about why you're feeling what you're feeling. Try to evaluate it. Spend some time on the one painting. Don't be on a duty premise. No, no, no. You know, two minutes for each painting. There are ten in the room. Right? Spend ten minutes in front of one painting. There, there are often places to sit. Sit and look at it. And just contemplate it. Feel it. Right? Um, so focus on, on the thing you like. Now, at some point, and I recommend going to museums a lot, so not just once, so... At some point, you might want to get a guide and, and figure out, okay, what are the, what are the famous paintings? What, is, what, are, what do people consider great art? And then just do the museum, do five, six, ten great pieces, and stand there and figure out whether you like them. And try to think about why they're considered great art, and maybe listen to an explanation of why they're considered great art. You know, people always ask me, do you like the Mona Lisa? Now, the problem with the Mona Lisa is it's become almost kitsch because people wear T-shirts with the Mona Lisa and it's advertising and it's everywhere. But if you actually stand in front of the Mona Lisa and, and look at it, and then you listen a little bit to the history and everything, the achievement of the Mona Lisa is monumental in the history of art. And you can learn to appreciate that and you can actually get a response because there's something incredibly beautiful going on there. And particularly if you have a context. Now, not all art needs a context, but some art does. So look for the greatness because you'll learn to, to, to love more art. You'll learn to respond to more art by focusing on what's historically be, being viewed as great. And maybe the values the greatness conveys to you are not your values. You know, you go to a museum in Europe, particularly in the Renaissance, 
And a lot of the, a lot of the, almost all the themes, almost all, if it's Italian art, all the themes are religious. And you go, well, I'm an objectivist. This is meaningless <laughs> to me. But is it? There's immense beauty. There's real emotion. There's striking values in many of these paintings. I mean, there are paintings of Jesus on a cross mm -hmm. that are incredibly touching, that are incredibly beautiful, and, and rip your heart out of, of a human being on a cross, and the evil of that, and, the, and, the, and the, the horror of that. But it's a powerful experience. It's like, again, maybe reading Dostoevsky or, or reading Tolstoy, but there's a, there's a great value, in, and if it's a great art, and this is the point Leonard makes in his, in his talk, if it's a great art, then it's focusing on what's important to the artist in this particular event, in this crucifixion. And again, so it's highlighting the importance and not dealing with the unimportant. And it's stylizing your mind to start looking for the important. It's stylizing your subconscious to focus on the important. So, you know, if you, if you, if you go to a museum and you, you really focus on the art, when you walk back to your hotel room, you're suddenly, you're, you're, you're just your visuals change a little bit. Oh, there are flowers over there. I didn't notice them before. And there's this over here. Suddenly, you're much more visually aware. You're much more visually focused just in your day-to-day -day life. So it, it changes you. And you can find, you can, you can get that benefit from art that is not projecting back to you your, every, every one of your values. So try to experience that. And that won't work for everybody, and not everybody will like it. And I, I, I like painting, so I respond in that way to painting. Other people, no, you know, painting is not where I get those values from. So I'm not interested. Uh, but I would suggest going to museums and doing that third level. And this is, I mean, I did this last time I was at the National Gallery uh, in London. And I, I found it incredibly pleasurable. But I've been to the National Gallery many times mm -hmm. and I've seen the paintings there, so I know it well. But I actually decided I'm going to do the whole museum. From beginning to end, I'm really going to take it all in, try to take it all in. And to me, the context was the history of art, history, and the relationship between history of art and history. And you could see it. Once you know the art and you know a little bit about it, you can see it. Oh, yeah, this is the, Rena this is the Middle Ages. Ugh. This is the Renaissance. And look at the changes. And look at Jesus of the Middle Ages and Jesus of the Renaissance. He's a completely different Jesus, right? Because the Renaissance, he's the strong, you know, uh, robust youth that's put in, in, the, in, the, in the Middle Ages. He's this withering, horrible, you know, uh, 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 shell of a, of a human being. And what does that mean? And what does that mean in terms of the history of the world? And what does that mean in terms of what's happening in the world? And then what is the art leading up to the Enlightenment? And could there be an Enlightenment without the art that led up? Could there be an Enlightenment without a Renaissance? I don't think so. Art, art is part of that cultural mm -hmm. change. You cannot get just pure ideas without that aesthetic experience. And do you see the change between the Enlightenment into Romanticism or into the 19th century, into the Romantic period? And to me, that was incredibly valuable. I did a, a whole podcast on it, and it was, it was a lot of fun. Now, I don't recommend that to everybody, but once you're at a certain point and you know enough, it's really good to get a big scope, a big picture of, of what it looks like, and you can get immense value out of it. And you can learn something. Again, it, art is not didactic primarily, but it can be. Right? There's certain elements that you can learn out of it. For example, how history is guided by ideas over time is reflected in art in dramatic ways. So to learn about the power of ideas over history, you can see that in art. It, it, you can also see it in history, but in art it's, it's visual and striking. Mm -hmm. uh, so that would be some of my advice uh, you know, in, terms of, in, terms of, uh, in terms of museums. I'll, I want to say one thing about the religious art, yep. um, and it goes back to a point that I made yesterday, which is that um, there's such a thing as moral emotions, and going to the history of the West, you have to take seriously that religions had, has had a near monopoly on ethics. And the idea that, that you can't get any value from religious art some of it is incredibly moving, and in particularly from the issues of moral emotions. Um, so the issue of reverence. So if, if, the, if Michelangelo's Pieta oh. turns you off because, well, a virgin birth is stupid, 
Um, it depicts such incredible reverence in the early, I mean, the, the later Pieta is, is a much more um, defeated and, and, and mournful work, but the earlier is, it, it conveys what real reverence looks like, and that is a moral emotion. And if, if, you've, if you've put into, I'm never looking at religious art, you're sealing yourself off, because religions had such a monopoly in ethics, you're sealing yourself off from that dimension of what art can project and convey. Now, some secular does it, but because religion's been so dominant, you ha it, it's selfish to pursue that and find that kind of value in some, and some of it doesn't have that kind of value, but some really does. So, so we're running out of time a little yeah. bit. Now, let, let me just say, I'm not gonna give you recommendations about literature or poetry or drama. There are people in the audience right now who are far bigger experts than that than I am, and I'm not an expert, and I, I don't know what I'm talking about, so don't, you know, on that area, you know, don't listen to me. Uh, Lisa's here, and Shoshana's here, and Anne is here, and, uh, and in their realms, they are the experts, and, and I'll leave them to recommend to you, make the recommendations, and don't ask in the Q&A, because I, I don't have anything to say, and when once, once I ventured into saying something, I got slapped in the face. Um, <laughs> equivalent to being slapped in the face, not literally. Uh, by, I won't say. Um, <laughs> some of you know. Um, but I do want to say something about, I want to say something quickly about music, and I do want to say something about movies and TV. Um, so I know we all love music. Music seems to be something that everybody responds to, and, and we respond primarily to the music that's around us, to the popular music. Most of us have very, very strong feelings towards the music we grew up with. Uh, you know, I, I, I was a teenager during the 70s, so there's no better music ever than, the, than the, that made in the 70s, right? Because it evokes certain emotions and certain memories and certain feelings that have to do with that era in which you grew up. And I think popular music, to a large extent, is built that way. What popular music does is it evokes very quick, easy memories and emotions that relate to when you first heard it. It's not deeper than that. And it's fun. And it's great, because I like remembering some th stuff about my teenage <laughs> years. Some stuff, not so much. Um, but it's, 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 yeah, it's what I grew up with. It's, it, it, has, it feels like home. It feels like home. And many of you might have grown up with a certain style or type of music or whatever, but, and, and that just feels right. It, it, it matches, and that's what I said. Embrace what you like. Don't, don't run away from that. But I really encourage you, particularly in the world in which we live today, to, to, to Check out classical music to, to try it. And I'm going to make a few recommendations on how to do it, the hows, right? Um, I, I'm going to recommend a few pieces and how to do it, but first let me say the how. Turn off the lights. Take care of all visual stimulation. So turn off the lights, make it dark. Make sure it's quiet in your room. Put on the piece of music and crank it to 11. <laughs> How loud it is matters. You can't listen to Beethoven quietly. It doesn't work. You can't listen to Achmaninoff as a whisper. It has to be fully envelop you. It has to be, it is a re and don't talk. Oh, it drives me crazy when people talk. And it's why, and when we get a classical concert, we don't talk, we listen. So do it at home. If it's good for the, for the theater with other people, you're not not talking because you're respecting other people. You're not talking because you're focusing on what's happening in front of you. Right? And there's a reason you go to other types of music and to concerts and everybody's yelling and shouting and clapping and, and singing along. And classical classic music, if you start humming along, people will slap you, right? <laughs> because it distracts from the focus. It's so important, there's so much there. And then don't try to do too much. Don't take a whole symphony in at once. We just don't have the attention span anymore to do that. You have to train yourself up. So take one movement and listen to it. Take a movement from Beethoven, listen to it. Take a break, take a movement from Rachmaninoff, listen to it. So put on the first movement of Rachmaninoff's second piano concerto, or third piano concerto, and just do that. And just turn the lights off and just let the music in, you know, envelop you. 
and let your mind, you know, I know some objectivists do meditate. To me, this is what meditation is. <laughs> this is my equivalent, right? Because I let the music, I try to empty my mind in that sense. I try to focus just on the music, not on images, not on thoughts. I try to take away the dialogue and just focus on the music and what it's doing to me. Um, you know, do Tchaikovsky, do Rachmaninoff, do Brahms, do Beethoven, do some Schubert early on. Don't start with Mahler. Don't start with Wagner. You know, start with, with, with the melodies are relatively, they're still complex, relatively simple, where the emotion is immediate. And, and start with one movement. Start with half a movement. It, it, you don't have to, it's, again, there's no duty here. You don't have to finish it. Experience what you experience. Oh, my mind is drifting. Okay, stop. And that's a way to really get into that world. And I think once you get into that world, the rewards are, you know, amazing. Uh, 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 emotional rewards are, are just amazing. I can't listen to classical music in the background. It grinds, it, it grates on me. Because, it, as Ankar said, it's like, no, no, Rachmaninoff should be listened to. Not, you know, in the background. So if somebody's playing a second piano concerto in the background, it's like, ah, no, this is too sacred. This is, I have real reverence for this. It's, it's not right to do it that way. You want to say something about music? Um, well, I'll say one other thing about how, because I, I think I said yesterday that the ma main lesson I took from the Romantic Manifesto is there's other art I should be exploring, and since I loved music, music was it. Um, I took seriously the, the hypothesis that it involves a real integration that your mind has to make and make over time seriously. So it's not listen to a piece and if you didn't respond, you need to, yep. to have it yep. do this fairly often for your mind to start being able to process it. And it took me, I did this when I was 17, it took me about two months, I think, to really start to respond to classical music. But I was willing to put in the time because if the rewards were what they promised to be, it's worth the time, and it certainly was. But yeah, so I took that from the book too. Yeah, that's definitely, I agree completely. I mean, repetition, doing it over, or listening to the same piece over again, you get more out of it, you'll learn how to appreciate it, and it takes time to appreciate it. It's so foreign to the way music is done today. It's so different that, uh, and the emotions it evokes are so much deeper and so much more powerful when you get to the point. Yeah. I, I think you'll be rewarded if you do it. Um, the most popular art form that we all experience regularly is, is television and movies. Um, and, and you can view this on a number of different levels. A lot of movies are just fun, and they're just fun to, to do, and, and that's fine. Um, I find there's very little that is really, you know, really has an impact on me, that has a, a really deep impact on me. It, when I go to the movies, I, you know, I don't ask in a Q&A. I can't stand superhero movies anymore enough. Like I saw two or three, got the point, repeating that 15 or 100 times doesn't change the one storyline. And I don't like superheroes, I just like heroes. Uh, giving them superpowers doesn't, I think, I think actually diminishes what it means, what it means to me because I, I don't have superpowers. So it doesn't reflect anything for me. Um, I find them boring and, and uninteresting. Uh, and, but, but yeah, I can understand going to see them, they're fun, they kind of, you get the, the momentary thing, but again, it's like pop art. It's like pop, pop music as mm -hmm. compared to, to, to real. I, I find most of the movies I love are movies that were made in the 40s and 50s, uh, even the 30s. Mm -hmm. I, I, I even went through a period when I was young where I did a lot of silent movies. And the, the benefit of silent movies is it forces you to focus in on what Ayn Rand said movies are about, which is the visual. Because there's no dialogue, so all you can do is, is look. And so, so you experience that visual. And I know if you, Ayn Rand recommends Siegfried. If you watch Siegfried, it's very strange. It's, for a modern eye, it's very strange. But I think it's, I think it's worth doing, and maybe watching it more than once so you get it, because it, again, conditions you to start looking at visuals and seeing visuals and embracing movies as visuals, even though, unfortunately, the makers of them are not always embracing that aspect of it. Um, I, you know, I think, I think television today has this immense potential because it can tell a long story, it can, it can, it can give us what, what, a, what a novel, somewhat, somewhat of what a novel can do, because it, it, it has, it, it's now embraced this miniseries, a long format 
of television, but unfortunately most of the stories are, are, are depressing and, and dark and you know, we talked a little bit about Breaking Bad. And by the way, I enjoyed some of Breaking Bad, not all of it. Um, I used to yell at the television uh, because I, but it's, it's it, so there's the elements there that you can enjoy, but overall, the fact that this is the best says something about the culture in which we live. So let me make a television recommendation. I hate doing these things, but, and, and, and I've said to other people, partially I'm making this recommendation to get validation. <laughs> I loved it, and I'm wondering if I'm, if it's real, right? If, if it's as good as I think it is. Because this is, I, I was so blown away by this television series. I so enjoyed it. It had such a profound impact, emotional impact on me and my wife. Um, and, and I'd love for you to have it, but I'd love for you to also, you know, somebody who knows something about this to tell me if I'm wrong. Um, it's called Mr. Sunshine. The challenge is it's in Korean. And I know some of you, I, I think Harry tried the first episode or something, and, and, you know, I think I read something on HBO. Get through the first episode. The first episode's hard, partially because you're trying to get used to Korean, partially because a lot is happening and you don't understand what's going on, and partially because, and I'm going to say something, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to differentiate people of a different uh, features. It's hard to say who is who. You know, you have to, you have to get used to their features because they're not like, like what we're used to, right? Um, so it took me a while to figure out who's who, but get through three episodes. And I cannot think of a, of, a, of, a, of a television series I've experienced with more positive values, real values, not superficial values, real values. Love, patriotism, and what happens when those clash. Uh, uh, you know, uh, multiple people loving one, multiple men loving one woman and the relationship between the men and the woman. I mean, it's just... And, and it, you know, it just was, I found it profound and, and moving. And, you know, I, there's one flaw in the movie, in the television, in my view, uh, that would have made it just perfect uh, in the end. But I'm not going to say what it is because I don't want to give anything away. But if you've seen it and you're curious, ask me. I will tell you. Uh, but uh, to me, it was what, and by the, oh, and the visuals. Oh, my God, the visuals are stunning. Talk about using the, the image to convey emotion in a movie, in, 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 a, in, a, in a television. I've never, I don't think I've ever seen a, a, a television series do it quite as well. If you watch the movies of Akira Kawasawa, the, the, the great Japanese director, uh, you get a little sense of that, 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 that Asian aesthetic and the, 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 the beauty of, of every frame. And here, the, every frame is beautiful. Every frame you want to stop and put up on a wall. But some of them, the emotion they evoke, just small movements, color, and just the image is, I guess, I guess you'll either be bored or you'll love me for that recommendation. <laughs> uh, but I definitely encourage you to go back to the 40s and 50s and, and watch a lot of movies. There's a lot of great art. There's a lot of uh, uh, very enjoyable stuff with, with some themes. Okay, so let me, uh, let me uh, let's try to wrap yeah. it up quickly here. Um, you know, focus on what you like. It might be great art, it might not be. But at the end, even after you go through the process of expanding, of elevating, at the end of the day, you have to like it. You have to respond to it. You have to understand what you're getting from it. Even if it's art you don't particularly like, you have to at least know what you're getting from it. Why? Like, like Shakespeare, we don't like the theme, but we like certain aspects, so you have to be able to differentiate. What are you liking and what are you not liking? What are you getting from it? Don't go watch Shakespeare out of a sense of duty again, because it's great, right? Go watch Shakespeare and practice watching Shakespeare to get to the point where you can understand the benefit you're getting from it. But if, you never, if that never happens, then stop watching it. Be selfish. It's about you. It's about your life. It's about making your life the best that it can be. Don't you, I mean, I used Ayn Rand's recommendations as a starting point. So, I, so the first thing after I read Durant, I, read first, I went and tried to read everything she recommended, right? And, and tried to view everything she recommended and looked at Vermeer and, and, and Rachmaninoff and looked at the novels. What does she recommend in the novels? What are the heroes of the novels like? And, and that's a great starting point, but don't make that the end point. And you'll find that you don't always agree with Ayn Rand in terms of her likes or dislikes. Again, 
I love Beethoven. Ayn Rand did not. Uh, and partially it's my sense of life versus Ayn Rand's sense of life. I, you probably know, I embrace the fight and the struggle. She viewed the fight and the struggle as something she had to do, but her focus was on that what was possible, what was possible in the 19th century, that, that vision of what life can be, that's what she wanted. You know, that, that state of happiness that didn't require the struggle, didn't require the challenge. But I embrace that, right? It's part of who I am. So to me, yeah, Michelangelo, uh, you know, there's nothing that moves me, I mean, there's so many things like this, but there's nothing that moves me more than Michelangelo's David. I could stand in front of Michelangelo's David for days. Um, and because it reflects what an ideal man is to me, right? And, 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 and it's that determination and that courage and that fearlessness and that beauty that is just projected back at you that it is, to me is overwhelming. So don't be willing to embrace who you are and what, what you like um, and what you can identify. Anything? Yeah, and at the end, you know, we'll just end with this. Go out and have and enjoy. Enjoy. Enjoy deeply. You know, understand and enjoy. And, and experience. Experience, experience, experience. And be, be selfish. It's, it's hard in the culture we live in in a sense that there's so many forces that are telling you no. And you have to continuously rem remember who you are and what you are and what your philosophy is. Art is one way in order to do that. Go out there and be selfish. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Scholar from Delaware. Hey, Scholar. Uh, <laughs> good morning, gentlemen. I would like to know what film directors that you both love the most. What f the, w the one film director that you love the most. <laughs> I knew I was going to get questions like this. And I have to say, <laughs> as I get older, I can't remember the names anymore <laughs> and things like that. But, you know, I, I, I love Fritz Lang, which Ayn Rand mentions. I, I even like his American movies, which not a lot of people mm -hmm. like, but I, I found his American movies really, really good. I like Hitchcock. Yeah, Hitchcock I would put as my top, I think. Yeah, Hitchcock. And, and, and again, if you, oh, oh, you know, maybe, you know, up there in the top three or top five, Ernst Lubitsch. Lubitsch. Mm -hmm. Ernst Lubitsch, mm -hmm. oh my God. So my favorite movies, Ninotchka to be or not to be. Uh, shop Around the Corner. Uh, shop, oh, shop Around the Corner, I love Shop Around the Corner. Uh, really, everything Lubitsch made, you, you know, I enjoy. So I hope you enjoy. Find Lubitsch movies. I mean, talk about a, a positive sense of life and, and, and joy and, and, uh, and uh, I mean, I mean, Ayn Rand did not like Ninochka, let's be clear. And, hmm. and she, she, I, I don't think she would have liked to be or not to be, and I understand completely why. Because Ninochka makes fun of communism. To be or not to be makes fun of Nazism. Uh, and and it, they're too... For, for her, and I can understand this, they're too evil to be made fun of. Right? They're too evil to be made fun of. I still enjoy them. Absolutely. So, um, so uh, Lubitsch, yeah. Good to go. And you said Dr. Ankar. There's yeah, so said, few. Uh, okay, you was going to say Hitchcock? Yeah, I would say Hitchcock, Hitchcock. for me, but it, it, movies aren't, I mean, a way higher value for Iran than Absolutely. they are. There's some movies I like, but... Um, that, that I have like views about all directors and stuff. It, do, it doesn't have as much of value to me. Okay. Yeah, I have long lists of movies <laughs> with rankings of them and what I liked and what I didn't like about them. And there are hundreds of them that, I, that I've, because I've watched thousands of movies. But let's try to make the questions really short because there are a lot of people in very little time. Thank you, gentlemen. Sure. Hi there. Hi. So I was wondering if either of you have heard of Louis Moreau Gottschalk. He is a uh, pianist and composer. Basically, at the, during the time of Chopin, he was called the Chopin of the Creoles or Chopin of New Orleans. And what you might think of him? I don't. I mean, I've heard some of his music. Okay. It was okay. I didn't respond greatly to it, but I haven't really explored. I haven't listened a lot to it. Okay. Um, but that's the extent. Well, I just want to recommend him. It's Gott sure. Schalk, G O T T S C H A L K. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. I mean, yeah. one of the things I know about the 19th century is that even second rate composers of the 19th century are fantastic. <laughs> they're not as good as maybe the first rate, mm -hmm. but they're good. You can get a lot out of them. And there were a lot of them. So once you get beyond that first rung, there's a lot of second rung composers who are 
who were really good. And, and that's true in painting, that's true in sculpture. There was so much painting and so much sculpture going on in that era. It was so, it's such an era that was so immersed in art that a lot of times you find the second rate people a good, better, a lot better than the first rate people often today. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about whether you, what you think the role of judgment is in the aesthetic experience in this sense. You said, you know, we went through the process of viewing work of art, responding to it emotionally, and then deciphering what your reason is for why you respond to it emotionally. And then would you agree that there's a next stage of judging whether your reason is consistent with your, philosophic, with your philosophy? Um, and if it's not working to correct, you know, whatever psychological or philosophical premise is, is conflicting, because you can't just trust that your positive reaction is based on a life-enhancing reason. You may be having a positive reaction because of a philosophical contradiction that that reveals. Do you think that that's a valid part of this process? I mean, I think it's, it's not part of the process. It's part of what you can get from art, and it's part of the issue of the self-exploration. But it's, 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 you have a very different focus than if it's, you think you're responding to something. I'm responding to the defeatism in the work, and I think of it, I have this real element in my soul that undercuts me in certain ways, that I don't think values are really possible in the end, and as a result, I'm too unwilling to take risks. And so if you start to think that about yourself, and that's part of what art can help you explore about yourself, but it's a very different process to then start thinking about yourself and the premises you hold, how they're embedded in your soul, how they manifest in your actions and in your emotions. And it's, but part of, so there is an issue about reprogramming your sense of life, and that doesn't mean wholesale necessarily, it can mean elements of it. And art is a window into your sense of life, but it's a very different focus than if you're going from now the art to this is what something I've learned about myself that I want to explore or for, further and think about and think about whether I need to change and and I'd be very careful yeah because it's very easy to be wrong about why you're responding the way you're responding it's not easy to figure out why you're responding to what what you're responding so I'll take the religious art example you're standing in front of a religious painting and you respond very positively to it or you, oh I must be embedded with Christian you know so <laughs> be careful how you do it yeah that you actually your evaluation is right and your judgment of yourself is right. Make sure you're not judging yourself based on one experience. You know, get multiple confirmations of it. Before you judge yourself, you want to know, you, you want to have uh, quite a bit of But you also can't evidence. look at that Christian piece of a, a painting and say, I'm pleased or I feel pleasure in response to it. And that means I should look and focus on what the positive elements yeah. are in the painting. Yeah. To be objective, you might be looking at the fact that Jesus is, has a bunch of followers who are following him, and that gives you some indication you have some sort of power lost premise, and you, you know? Yes. Would you no, agree? It, yes, and it, it, for some reason that reminded me of a point I wanted to make and didn't. How many of you have seen the movie Braveheart? Oh, yeah. What is the theme of Braveheart? Freedom. <laughs> really? Really? Freedom? I mean, don't impose your objectivist values on a piece of art where they don't belong. They're not there. The freedom that he's fighting for is the freedom to be ruled by a Scottish king instead of an English king. That's not freedom as we understand it. And the movie has really good elements in it. There are aspects of the movie that I like. But it's not about freedom. And, and you can't impose your, I, I see so many people when they analyze movies, taking their objectives, values, and finding them in the movie where it's not there. Be objective about how you evaluate what is going on on screen and what the story actually says or what the painting actually is before you do the evaluation and everything else. But I hate to break it to you guys, but, but it's not in Braveheart. You know, it's, it's about, and it's not in Game of Thrones, right? Game of Thrones is all about Who's going to rule? Rule meaning rule. <laughs> you know, not respect individual rights and protect our freedoms. Right? <laughs> Neither one of those. So, so they're not about freedom in the sense that we understand the concept of freedom. It's, 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 a, it's very collectivist. 
It's, I mean, there's certain issues of justice and injustice in the movie that, that make that palatable, but, but that's not the theme. So remember, you have to be the context of whatever, the 16th century. Was there even a concept of freedom in the 16th century as we understand it today? And what do those words mean to the, act, to the, to the, to the characters in the thing? So be objective about your evaluation of the thing. And that's the fear I have in being too judgmental about yourself, is you're not going to be objective about evaluating the art, and then you're going to judge yourself on a, on a wrong basis. So, so get good at evaluating before you do the judging. And I'd make one wider point about that. What it, it connects to something I said earlier. You okay. can't assume that it has a theme because it's called a movie. <clears throat> um, <laughs> Art is an achievement. It requires a real integration and a sense of life on the part of the artist who's then able technically to put this in. I think many movies don't have a theme. And this is part of what I find funny about when people are analyzing it. Like it has to have a theme and it has to have a subject. No, it can just be a conglomeration of things that don't make any sense. Should we do this? You can, if you want to. I uh, know. Okay. okay, so here's a question to you guys. You can respond. I, I can show a piece of art. And tell you tell you a few things about it, and I think it might evoke different responses in the audience and kind of maybe stir things up a little bit. Or we can just keep on taking questions. <laughs> the questioners are like, no, take a question. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this is the condition I'm showing it, right? A lot, some of you, many of you probably know the piece and know its, its origins and history. Don't say anything, please. So uh, no comment on, on the part of those of you who know it. And then I'll just say a few things and, uh, you know, hopefully to create a little conversation out there because I, I think you're going to, my expectation is you're going to respond differently to it. So this is a test. Right? If you all respond the same, it's not good. Um, all right, put, put, put the painting up. All right, so this is... Um, this is a painting, obviously, and, and my expectation would be that people respond to it very differently, and I've seen people respond. There are people who hate this. Um, it's, some people would even say it's, it's a little pornographic, and they, they, they don't like it. And it projects, it has, a, it has a definite theme, which I'm gonna tell you what it is, what I think it is, uh, in a minute. Um, it, it's, it's obviously related, I mean, it's a nude. Uh, it's a nude that's unabashed, it's a nude that's looking straight at you. There's a certain pride in the nudity. Um, their uh, hands are behind her back. What does that mean? Vulnerable. Vulnerable, yeah. There's a vulnerability there. What else does it mean? Submissive. Submission. I mean, she, this could be in a different context. I've seen paintings like this where she's a slave girl. She's not here. You can tell that immediately by how she's looking and, the, and the, she's enticing you. She's not submissive in the sense of she's enticing. She's looking up. She's inviting. And if you're male and female, you probably respond to this painting differently. Right? I mean, the theme of this painting, I think, and, and uh, it, it was nice to hear that Ayn Rand agreed with me. <laughs> I, I agree with Ayn Rand, rather, um, <laughs> is femininity. Or at least Ayn Rand's view of femininity. And it, it, it really concretizes that, in a, for me at least. And, I, and, and you know, you, you'll have to judge and you'll have to think about whether it does for you or not. But for me, it, it really captures what Ayn Rand's view of femininity is. Um, this is a painting by Capaletti. It's a painting that hung in Ayn Rand's apartment. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's one of my all-time favorite paintings. Uh, and it's, I can't pass it, I've got a, I've got a photograph of, of it hanging in my house. Uh, I can't pass it without stopping and, and, and looking. And, uh, and it's, it's, it's very evocative and very emotional and I think very powerful. So um, anyway, I thought, I thought you'd enjoy or get something out of it uh, and something out of maybe your response to it vis-a-vis my response to it vis-a-vis -vis other people's response to it. So, okay, well, okay. we take it down and take, take a couple of questions. Two minutes. Uh, <laughs> Thank you're you. Not, you're not sure. <laughs> That's um, good. 
So, Yaron, you mentioned that um, in movies and in that television show, Mr. Sunshine in particular, some of the frames are so beautiful that you could, you know, put yep. them on your wall. But then there's this concept that photography isn't a valid art form. So I'm wondering, you know, if, if it's not just a capturing of existence, but it's, you know, a staged photograph, is there any way that photography can be an art form if the, move, like if the pictures of movies are such an important piece of that art form? Well, I think it's very different because the pictures are serving a purpose in, in movies, that the pictures are not an end in themselves. The pictures are serving the purpose of the theme. And the pictures would mean, at the end of the day, the pictures would mean nothing if it, they didn't serve the theme of the series. And in my view, uh, of Mr. Sunshine, the, the, the pictures do serve the theme. That is, the, 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 the every frame is serving the emotional and the, and the thematic purpose of what of, of, of what is you know what is going on and 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 so they, they integrate really really well uh, photography is just one still image it's not serving it's not serving an, another artworks purpose however I, I'll say this I think with the ability to manipulate photographs that we have today <coughs> it might be come an art form I think just taking a photograph is not but I think your ability to manipulate it in pretty, pretty dramatic ways, I think might, it might be. I, I, again, I'm not a, a, a philosopher of art, so I, I'm not going to say it is or it isn't, but I think it's something that should be considered by philosophers of art, given the ability in Photoshop to do stuff with it, that, that just taking a picture is, is very different. Thank you. Yep. Last question. Sorry, guys. Thanks. Um, you talk about exploring and identifying your own sense of life and maybe thinking about that on paper. But yesterday you said that a statement like, oh, my sense of life is malevolent or benevolent, that's not sufficient. So can you give an example of what sort of vocabulary or statements would go into an appropriate description of a person's sense of life? I'll give one aspect of it that I think is I mean, she calls it the key aspect. So, so she calls it the key concept when you're talking about a metaphysical orientation is the concept of important. Um, and that important in its fundamental philosophical sense means a metaphysical issue. What's, what is deserving of attention? And her answer is reality. And that doesn't mean that it's not a value. It has, there's a value element that's implicit, but what you view as this is important, I have to take this into consideration. When I act, when I decide what to do, how I think, that is a metaphysical consideration. So you, one of the things to do, I think, and she gives examples of this, of being honest with yourself of what you regard as important. And she gives things like, it's important to obey my parents. But that, uh, it's important to understand things. It's important not to stick my neck out. It's not an example of hers. Um, but, and these are highly specific too. So there's a difference between it's important to obey my parents, it's important to obey my mother, <clears throat> um, it's important to obey my teachers, it's important to get good grades. There's all kind, and I think the flip side of what you regard as this is not important and I can't fathom how anybody takes this as important is this gives you a contour of, starts to give you a contour of what your metaphysical orientation is. And it's highly, it's again, highly particular and highly individual. But I think that, as it's right that that's the key concept in trying to, trying to conceptualize, to start to conceptualize it. So. Great, thank you all again. Uh... Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to never miss a video.